this is a spoiler. You can't listen you know. to this and not have spoilers. Sorry, this is a brilliant story. I'm glad some thought so. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it in the end. I, I'll say that. Yeah, so let's jump into that because, like, we ended up talking about how that Cesar, you just discovered that there was a 21st chapter. It wasn't in the American or the film version. And there's a foreword in my edition, anyway, from the author. And it was just as good as reading the novel. I read this back when um, and have seen the movie back when, but like didn't remember much of it. But the foreword is very interesting. Anybody else read that? Well, it's very good. No, yeah. I have the uh, Penguin Cheap Person Edition, which has nothing. You mean about the last chapter? No. Yeah. Yeah, well, his entire forward is interesting because he frames this discussion about the clockwork orange is that, you know, you would lose free will if you don't have a choice. And he thought that the lack of the 21st chapter and the movies with, you know, him grinning and I'm cured, ironically, going back to violence, signaled a firm, solid state that was, you know, man as evil, say. That was the story. And he had a, a problem with that, um, even though he said, uh, there was a funny uh, quote about it at the forward. He said something like, both Kubrick and my New York publisher fully bask in the rewards of their misdemeanor. <laughs> if, of course, is terrible. Um, that was his next thing. But so, yeah, that, that's, I think, a very crucial frame for, and he's, he made the difference between allegory, and we had talked about allegory last time, so I thought this was like very telling, and then I looked it up. It was, you know, basically a story of ideas with people as representations, or a fable, and he was like, if that's what I was doing, that would be that, but this is fiction where I believe people can change, and what you see in fiction is the change of a human being. So to have him recommit to how he was would not be an act of art, even in Burgess's eyes. I also think it's so crazy to think, like, when, as you read the book, it becomes very clear that it's about being intelligent versus being mature and how these are like young people. They're doing what young people do. And it's just crazy. It's like, well, obviously it has to end with him growing up because this is also, it's about many things, but it's also about, you know, coming of age and putting in a way, like just understanding that you, when you're a kid, you do these really, really stupid things and you have sort of no real guidance or no maturity or no wisdom, but that, that comes over time. I, I don't really buy Anthony Burgess's own reading of his own story. I like to the if his point is that, you know, Alex got a conscience in the end, I don't think that's what happened. And I doubt, I doubt that's what he, he just lost his base, vicious appetite. Hey, back up. Um, yeah, go on. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah, okay, sorry. Let's. <laughs> we haven't even done a, a summary of what happened. The, the, the oh, I mean, it, we can skip the summary if we want to. I just no. no let's no, let's no, do sure. it. Yeah. Okay, but uh, remember this point because this was a fruitful, fruitful thing we were talking. Oh, about. Oh, very it. important. Um, very important. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I, Cesar, I, I wouldn't want to. Did you have something that you'd like to add there, or I mean, or, or did uh, it was something like ringing, or did you just want to like make sure that we got into it? Uh, you know, well, slowly? I mean, um, on the point of the ending and. And the controversy of the ending, I kind of wanted to lay my cards on the table and just say, like, I just read the book, no forward. I looked, I, I, I felt like some of the themes the book explored were, like, unfinished. So I tried to look for some secondary literature, but I thought it was all terrible. Uh, so really, my reading of this book is just just from what I have. And there's a slight, like, Zizek thing on the Ode to Joy that I want to bring up. But, uh, but I saw that a couple of articles that mentioned that 21st chapter and the ending and what it meant. And so I, you I, haven't read it, just to be clear. I have read the 21st chapter chapter just not the interpretation that like this is a redemption of the the main character for instance i, I don't i don't quite agree with that so i, I just i want to obviously bring that up well, why don't we start the summary and move forward from there yeah I, I think the book is not too long and uh in trying to summarize it uh i always fell into just speaking for too long so i'll just give a rough framework and i'm sure anything that feels important to us will bring up it's uh, broken up into three parts, narrated by our protagonist, Alex, who's 15 years old at the beginning of the book, comes across as, you know, some sophisticated teenager. But uh, the main thing you'll notice quickly is that it's uh, written in a uh, dialect that's called Nadsat, a Slavic English rhyming slang that has a, I think Jennifer mentioned this before we started, uh, a wonderful cadence to it once you get into the book. 
And the only time I've been able to claim Polish privilege is uh, that most of the words are just decipherable for anyone who speaks any sort of Slavic language. <laughs> um, it's uh, set into some sort of you know dystopian future where people are forced to work, violence is uh, plenty, and, and order seems to be scarce. Um, him and his gang, which he calls his droogs, go out and commit what they call ultraviolence. And uh, I mean, if anything needs a, if our massive international audience is concerned about uh, violence, especially of the sexual sort, this this has plenty of it. So watch out. Uh, but they do things like, uh, you know, drink maloco with drugs, uh, you know, milk with some assortment of drugs. They go and rape and kill and beat up people without uh, seemingly any purpose. Um, this is part one. Uh, there's, I, I'm only mentioning this one specific incident, and hopefully I won't get too specific in the future, but there's an incident at the uh, Korobor bar where they frequent, where there's a lady singing the Ote Joy, Beethoven's Ote Joy, and uh, his oafish gang partner, his, uh, uh, called Dim, interrupts the singer, leading Alex, or main uh, uh, narrative, to, to hit him, which leads to some sort of internal gang fracture. But they decide eventually to go on this big robbery of an old woman in a uh, house with some cats. Uh, Alex goes in, gets attacked by the cats, and realizing the cops have been called, goes for the front door, and the same uh, a gang member hits him in the head, knocking him out, leaving him for the, uh, leaving him for the cops to, cops to get him. Uh, part two kind of starts, realizes that uh, Alex had actually murdered the old woman he was robbing. He's sentenced to 14 years in jail. Uh, he does things like take up reading the Bible, but only for the violent parts. <laughs> He's cramped in a cell with other people. An older convict eventually joins and uh, tries to rape Alex himself, which leads to him getting beat up by the entire cell. Uh, Alex finishing him off with a few fatal kicks and killing him. Uh, however, this leads to an incident where uh, instead of being, you know, reprimanded or punished further, he's sentenced to a new technique called, uh, I think, the Ludovico technique, however you want to pronounce that, because they're worried about the prisons being overcrowded, this, that, and the other. And this technique is some combination of him being drugged, which induces some sort of nausea, strapped down to a chair, his eyes kept open by some mechanical device, and being forced to uh, to watch incredibly violent videos, which include like some of the music he loves. Uh, this is some kind of behavioralist method to get him uh, to set him with some sort of disgust for the violence he's been practicing up to now. Uh, finally, in part three, he's released, uh, seeing that he's completely reformed and uh, sickened by the violence he had one time practiced. Uh, at one point, he's beat up by older men, one of the older men that he had at, uh, in the first part, I think, beat up. He's uh, driven away by cops and beat up some more, and he realizes the cops are who, who else but uh, Dim, his old gang member, and a rival gang member, I think Billy Boy, that they had uh, one speed up and almost killed uh and he ends up at a house of another man that he had one uh once beat and uh the wife of his that the entire gang had uh gang raped to death it turns out um the man actually doesn't recognize who he is he realizes uh another fun fact is this man had been writing the book clockwork orange so it's kind of circular in that uh that matter but this man uses Alex with some sort of op oppositional political party to try to bring down the government. He's supposed to be using Alex as, uh, as an example of why the government is terrible. What they do is they put him in an apartment where they, uh, the sound of music eventually leads Alex to try to kill himself. However, Alex does survive, and instead of taking down the government, the government offers him a job, a decent job, where he uh, finds a new gang and gets cured of his cure, in a sense, continues on committing ultra-violence with a new gang, finally meets uh, one of ex another one of his ex-gang uh, members, Pete, who is now on his way to being a good member of society, married and having dropped his nat sat speak even, uh, and Alex kind of reminisces and thinks about the, uh, how bored he is of the violence he's been committing heretofore, and that's uh, hopefully short enough. <laughs> yeah, that was exceptionally uh, concise. So, um, so um, I, I can. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, uh, okay. I, yeah, I don't. I don't want to get ahead. Yeah, um, because I really do think that this this kind of like free will fight it out is coming. So, but I don't want to get there too quickly or whatever, uh, because it seems like there's a difference in interpretation on like what this means for the character, and it's interesting because we have the author weighing in uh, in this situation. So, but anyway, uh, I'm going to yield it for anybody else for a second. Maybe we could talk about like right out of the gate. What was it like for you all when you first started reading with so much of this slang that obviously, well, unless, unless you're Cesare and you kind of could interpret, what was it like for you to start reading it? And how long do you think you were into it before you kind of had a grasp of the language? Before you had to start looking it up, because there is a a dictionary a specific, for this particular. I relied heavily upon the, the dictionary for a while, and then it became 
it was interesting. It was, it was, I, I just think it was amazing how he could do this because it's over 200 words. And I mean, they're very strange words, just very strange words. And it didn't take very long before it just felt normal. And you kind of were re- like, for me, it didn't take that long. And it just is, I thought it was. Yeah, I had that experience too, is that I, you know, in the beginning I was, you know, I had to open the dictionary right next to it and I'm looking and checking. And then very quickly, I, I just, you get into a rhythm that's sort of, I don't know, even a musical sense of rhythm where, you know, even if the specific word, like maybe I didn't remember, um, like I eventually figured out vidi, which meant C, right? Yeah. And after a while that, that didn't have an effect. There was, I guess the, another word, malenchek, I didn't always remember, but it didn't seem to matter. It made sense. And after a while, I didn't have to check the dictionary. And I found that fascinating that that was able to happen. Like, what mood did you feel like you got? I'm just really interested in this. When you were reading this, what was the experience? Because I have not seen the movie, so maybe that could have, like, ruined it for some people. When you read it, were you horrified? Like, this is, like, so violent or whatever. Or did you have a different experience? I was horrified when I saw the movie, too. (laughs) And I saw that 100 years ago. Yeah, the violence is horrific. I think that that was extremely disturbing. Yeah, I, I was not horrified by it. I was. Like, I don't mean it in a negative way. I'm just saying that to me, it made sense in, in the structure of what Burgess was doing here. But it didn't, you know, it didn't bother me in that sense. It was, it was terrible. Like the things that were happening were terrible. Obviously, if they're yeah. like, you know, they rape a ten year old girl, basically. But I don't know the way that it was said because it was using all of this different language didn't register as so just offensive. The, the scene that you just mentioned there, the uh, the rape of the two ten year girls, for me was the most uh, horrific, and it's one of those like I had to kind of pause and recollect myself. And it's one of those things where I don't know if he's doing this Nabokovian thing where you're supposed to side with the uh, witty word of its narrator, Alex himself, and combination of the uh, high class traits that you want to identify with, like his love of high art, like Beethoven. But it's it's I want to unpack the word disturbing, but it definitely it was disturbing for sure (laughs) well yeah he's he's the narrator also so like we're in his life to begin with and he's incredibly unlikable but i mean to go to the language i mean there's a certain like if you've ever done i mean this is like you can do an improv exercise where you just communicate about something in gibberish and things make sense because there's an internal logic which is yeah in an improv you the thing you agree to be talking about say you know um, buying a soda or uh, in this case you know the real he uses it. It's not just crazy, you know, I mean, everything does mean something. So it's easy to figure stuff out whenever he talks about, you know, faces constantly. And then you get that's like the idzvi or whatever, or something like that, or the idz or something. And, you yeah, know, I- over and over, it kind of comes together and, you know, makes a thing. But I think that reading the forward again, that thing really colored this for me because he called it a kind of cowardice to use this like barrier between, uh, I guess, objective description of reality, say. Yeah, um, that's what I that's what I felt is like obviously it was horrific. It's like your mind intellectually knew that it's horrific, right? But if you're a, say if you're a teenager reading this. And he's 15 by the way. That doesn't land until I'm sorry, I want to get that right back, yeah. but he's 15, right? End of act 1, you're like, "Oh damn, this is a 15-year-old." Yeah, he's been like, acting it, yeah. Yeah, and even yeah. the 10-year-olds before like when he was talking about them, you know, they're already engaging in like these kind of we can get into that later too, but the idea is For me, when I read it, it it was bad. It was terrible, but it was like detached because you had to sort of translate so much. And I don't know, I don't want to take us too far off topic, but if if you guys ever saw the, um, the Wolverine movies and then there was Logan, if you saw Logan, it was like there, it was nothing like the other movies because it actually showed the blood and the violence. Whereas in all these other movies, they would show the movement of a sword, but never any blood. And it was, the idea was that, you know, you kind of detached yourself from what was actually happening and it and it allowed you to sort of have an empathy for the character it allowed you to not be so repulsed by this character that you couldn't be later moved when he goes to jail and when he's being subjected to these and it almost i mean, I, th- I think it it's interesting to see how that acts on you as a reader with a conscience you know and what that does to your sense of conscious conscious feeling about what's happening I thought it was a, an interesting move and it was I w- I'm with you um, that it was weird to hear him say that it was a cowardly move because I thought it was actually a genius move. Yeah, well, I mean, it definitely does do something. Yeah, I, I, I don't. I mean, I, I don't want to go back and forth on this like too much because, like, I, I am very interested in what he thinks about what he's done because his intentionality seems clearly executed in the story, which is what. So, like, I can't help but seeing 
like I wasn't sympathetic with him as much as I was waiting for the ironic author universe to fuck with him. Like I was waiting for this kid to get his come and like and so whenever the guys come in and start like injecting him with stuff and he's like, oh, are these vitamins? I can't wait to see the movie. You're like, yeah, all right. Like, yeah, this kid's going to get it. Like there's a turnabout coming. And then like it folds in and he visit, he gets to see everything. You know, it's very, uh, what's that? It's a wonderful life or something like that. Like he comes back around and sees his life like without him or uh, or how things have moved on or he's had a remove from things. And you really get uh, a story of this person. Like I was thinking this is like Scarface where you see someone completely destroyed by what they did, except in Scarface, there's no like turnaround in the 21st chapter. He just dies because he commits to his lifestyle. He's a psychopath, right? So there is no getting back at a psychopath. That like a very strong... But is he? Alex? I mean, he's a full on, like, you know, in The Sopranos, Tony Soprano, he's just, the more you talk to him and the more you try to reason with him, the, the more skilled he gets at being a psychopath. This guy, to me is a full on psychopath. He gets enjoyment out of it in a way that is is not human, right? That's not how I don't know. I don't know if I necessarily buy the psychopath. I mean I'm willing to buy it, but my feeling is that he is a mode. It is a process. He is a process for Burgess to play out his point here. Yeah, like violence, right? I mean the mode is violence and like that youthful thing. Like it's about that. Right. I, and, and it's evil. Uh, I, I agree with the psychopathic label specifically just because I feel there's a specific way that they show that a lot of his decisions, whether it was in part one or part two where he was under the uh or part three where he was uh post therapy, all his decisions were very much uh amoral. They were like driven by something other than what we would consider morality. Well, no, I mean, but he does have a morality that's functioning. I mean, and we can uh, try and dig into that but like he does believe what he's doing is the good fight it's a it's a battle of ethics like we would disagree with like what he believes in a nietzschean philosophy like, yeah, in a kind of hedonistic sense but even when he is under his therapy he kind of doesn't associate with the i don't want to say the good acts but the lack of bad acts that he's prevented from doing right it's not moral choices that he's forced into it's just no definitely not yeah definitely not um yeah moral but behavioral and that's like the crux of it but then the 21st chapter comes around and i mean it does seem like he's having and like he's softening up with age you know like he like it's He's, you know, sees it like a baby and thinks it's attractive in a way that he never could have before. So, so then doesn't that negate the psych, the psychopath argument? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that, like, unless you think that all teenagers are psychopathic for a while. No, which see, seems I, don't fair. Know. I think he's a psychopath in that his motivations for things are without, I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess in a sense, maybe all teenagers are psychopathic in some way, in the sense that they're not, they don't have the awareness of others, their empathy isn't fully developed, whatever you want to call it. But to me, he's a psychopath path because he is so smart and he's so like aware of what he's doing and he just has absolutely no regard for anybody else's point of view like he's just completely without care about what it would be like to be that person that's why I thought the 21st chapter, I didn't read it as strongly as other people did as far as he's reformed now or anything like that. I, I don't still think he's reformed. He's, I think he's just as solipsistic as he was before. He just, I think you know, he's a good psychopath. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I think he's like a psychopath whose drives have changed. Totally agree with that. Can I bring up a quote? Yeah. Okay. There's a place where he's talking with his, I guess you could say, parole officer, Dartel, Deltoid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's, you know, the parole officer is checking in with them and he's discussing with them. But I think this is just his, this is just the narrator kind of giving an account of himself. The parole officer is kind of like, well, you gotta, you know, stay, you gotta stay good. You gotta keep out of trouble, all this stuff. And this is kind of Alex's own commentary, an account of himself, I think. But brothers is biting up their toenails over what is the cause of badness is what turns me into a fine laughing mal malchick. Uh, you know, the people who are biting their toenails are the good people, I guess, here. They don't go into what is the cause of goodness. So why of the other shop? If looties, i.e. people, are good, that's because they like it. And I wouldn't ever interfere with their pleasures and so of the other shop. And I was patronizing the other shop, i.e. the bad stuff. So his point here is that, oh, good people are like, oh, why are bad people so bad? Oh, whatever. But it is Alex's point 
is just the good people are good because they like to be good and the bad people are bad because they like to be bad. So going on, more ba more badness is of this. This is now he's trying to give a defense of badness, I think. More badness is of the self, the one, the you or me on our oddly oddy knockies. And that self is made by bog or God and is his great pride and redot redosti. <laughs> Whatever the fuck that is. But the not self cannot have the bad, meaning they of the government and the judges and the schools cannot allow the bad because they cannot allow the self. And is not our modern history, my brothers, the story of brave Malinky selves fighting with these big machines. I am serious with you, brothers, over this. But what I do, I do because I like to do. So he's trying to say, okay, maybe I'm bad. However, isn't our story of modern liberalism a story of uh, bad people trying to allow? I, this is maybe a really bad argument, but you know, isn't isn't in some sense, you know, the story of liberty, the story of people wanting to basically be allowed to do this supposedly bad stuff? I think so. At some point in there, he says the idea is to take a make a bad into a good or a good into a bad. And I think it's funny the the, sh the word that they use so much is um, in this book is which was the most difficult for me to keep continually translating was horror show and horror show means good in this book. I so love that. I think it's just interesting because the idea is to me sort of seems like well it's like there is no morality like morality is just like you just happen to be a good person because you happen to like to do this and I'm an anomaly because I happen to like to do this other thing but you somehow think that I'm like something's wrong with me or you know that I'm some sort of evil person like this inherently evil person like there's some kind of mess i up. think the whole point of burgess's effort here goal is the the argument and he says it in the introduction that evil has to exist and good has to exist in order for there to be a moral choice a and b don't exist yeah you need bad and vice versa yeah but by ba alex's own account there's no choosing. There's just you. There's well, no some choosing. good people yeah. like to be good, and bad people like to be bad. And yeah, that's it. So that's well, life. That's the, the structure point, of the world. That's the structure of humanity. Who's one good person in this novel? I think the priest, the chaplain, or whatever. The chaplain what? at the uh, at the prison. He misreads Alex's religious devotion, and he's purely against that therapy based off religious grounds. I mean, we can talk about. The morality of the behavioral treatment, but I'm not maybe sure. F. Alexander. But he's also using Alex no. as a political tool, right? And and he tortures Alex because he he wants to get revenge. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, so I don't mean that he comes out. I guess he doesn't come out well. Maybe that's like who comes out well because I can see him as like a good character that really got screwed. It's like understandable, you know, like where, I, right. but like he got, but he got turned right. Like I forgot about the. Um, yeah. I mean, he must have been the one that was doing that. He must have figured it out, though the narrator doesn't figure it out. So, yeah, I forgot. No, about agreed. That. No, you're right. There's probably no good people. Maybe like the wife that got killed. I just want to maybe overcomplicate this, but I don't think Alex's parents were good people either because they abandoned him no. at his hour of no. need as well, right? Like, well, they also didn't have the full picture um, at the time. They hadn't gotten the paper and they had every reason to treat him as such, just showing back up, you know, without knowing that things had gotten different. But I feel like they're, I don't want to shift topics too much. I thought they were introduced in that scene where they side with the border instead of Alex as the limits of rule-based order over like intu intuitive familial love. I mean, I guess they're, but I, I don't think about it as... Uh, <sighs> There's a limit to what the what a person like family can even do. Like there's there's like enabling at a point, which arguably they were even doing up until then. You know, it like I, I mean, I guess the only thing I could point to again would be to innocence. Like, wasn't there a general by being the anti-hero? Didn't wasn't the antithesis that the world actually had good? in it that he was opposed like is it implicit that there was good is that enough you know i mean i can't point to a good character but like isn't he opposed against a good that is just not in the narration you know i think that exists but it's outside the realm of this book but but comes into it in negative through goals or intentions or you know the the mild chaos that they create unknowing what they you know like they just leave bodies like like we don't know what happened you know, in and out of these people's lives. Like, I guess, isn't it safe to construct like a, I mean, good faith argument of the world that's good. What? And then he's in it. 
But there's also the idea of, I mean, this is probably just way off, but there's the idea of, you know, the, this, the other character is the state, right? Who's just imposing everything upon people. And really the people who are good are the people who are acting on their own, right? Who are trying to resist or trying to be free thinkers, I guess. So I think the idea of good is just really kind of garbled in this book. So I think it's a, a very confused, a confused thing because People who are good are not really, I feel like they're not really being good. They're not really, they're just doing what they're told to do, or they're just sort of. Yeah, well, so maybe we can bring in like, good is going to get confused so long as like we're using their terms for it, because like, this is the transfiguration of values, right? Uh, I hope I'm getting this right, where it's like, it used to be good to be the raper and the killer, because you would confer special, you know, genetic chances. And then there was a time where we hit a critical social mass where it was no longer sustainable to keep doing that. And then you got into some kind of game theory where you can have a certain amount of assholes always and that can go up and down. But um, that but that gets into a different thing. Then good is not just like a ch preferential choice. It's valued in the only thing that can be valuable. And so I feel like his opposition to this is just it's not like a really good argument. So what I find interesting is that these kids these teenagers even want to make up words to speak Nansen or whatever the, what the hell the language is called. This because artificial quasi Russian language. Um, why do they speak it? And maybe there's a tribal identity formation aspect. But I kind of wonder whether they're speaking it in order to distance themselves from the horrible acts that they're actually doing. And in that sense, there's a sort of backhanded compliment, I guess you could say, to the good. That might be why they would need to use this dehumanizing language. Yeah, that's, I mean, th I can just like throw a wedge in here and then you guys can take it away like from this point. But uh, Burgess also said uh, about the good and the bad and the choice that also people have to have a mix of both. Otherwise, it's inhuman. So there has to be like some kind of a struggle going on and you have a blend of it and then you know, something turns out. So I also think that these characters have got something going on. And so that's why the psychopath definition doesn't seem to work. And maybe you guys don't buy some kind of not redemption. I think that's too strong, but some but some kind of turning a leaf into like or a maturation. I mean, he's only 19. His brain's not even done developing. So, I mean, this there is a change of things happening, go, like going on. And I think that it's not so strict and we shouldn't look to the narrator's vision of history with, you know, these binary good and bad and it being a whatever decision. Can I point in on what I think is the really key thing here? And I'll, I'll quote Burgess himself about it. What, he says, one may take the principle of evil as applying in areas of conduct where the destruction of an organism is not intended. It is wrong to push drugs among children, but few would deny that it is also evil. Capacity of an organism for self-determination is being impaired. Maiming is evil. Acts of aggression are evil though we are inclined to find mitigating factors in the hot spirit of revenge or in the desire to protect others from expected, if not always fulfilled, acts of violence. We all hold in our imaginations or memories certain images of evil in which there is no breath of mitigation. Four grinning youths torturing an animal, a gang rape, cold-blooded vandalism. It would seem that enforced conditioning of a mind, however good the social intention, has to be evil. To me, that's the really critical thing here is that when he's taken into that room in, at the prison, you know, and given and shot up with the, all that shit and his eyes are, you know, held open and you watch, they're conditioning him. And that conditioning is the true evil here. Taking away the choice, taking away freedom, you know, is choice, right? Weren't we talking about this last night at the Aldous Huxley thing, <laughs> Dan? Well, right. But the thing is, is that just think about why don't I do bad things, right? I don't do bad things because I, you know, if I've ever felt like I wanted to punch someone or something like that, it's in no small part because to some extent, I, I don't want that person to suffer. If like some telemarketer guy calls me up and I'm, I'm about to scream at this person, I'm like, this is this person's stupid job. Just get over it. Right. There's impulses that, you know, make you want to be good. And in the absence, of those impulses, I, I, I don't know. Those impulses don't exactly give me a choice of whether to be good or not. It's, I don't want to do bad because I feel sorry for people, right? Right. Well, it's arguable that there is a, a effect of conditioning going on from the point 
that we're born. It's determined by who raised us, the environment. And there's all that argument between, you know, DNA and environmental 50-50, whatever the effect is on each of us. The thing is, and it's hard to ignore that there is both good and evil in all of humanity. I think you hit the nail on the head there, Laura, but I, I, and I want to hear your response to this, is that I thought the, uh, what the book was pointing out was, well, what is the difference between this behavioral therapy, which uh, Alex is subjected to, and the behavioral therapy that all healthy young adults um, are subjected to as children, where, you know, through the um, role of parenting being brought up in parenting and socialized socialization you were brought up into people who don't do these violent acts and through whatever random series of contingencies alex didn't get that here he is as a violent person what's wrong with using the shortcut method to get him back to what a normally young healthy adult would have that it's the government okay it's the government that's doing that that i'm not saying that that so we can go into the whole question of how we're defining conditioning and versus raising a child etc cetera, etc cetera. government's also conditioning people in this society as well oh it's- absolutely well, well and then I- also like why not just kill him rhetorically what yeah what what i think is interesting in the story is you see it a couple of times when he interacts with his parents and then also when he interacts with some people in the bar where it's like, you know, these are like little bratty shits running all over, just doing whatever they want. And like the older people are afraid of them. And it just reminded me, like I kept reading it and thinking like, these are those moments when I'm sitting with my six-year-old and my eight-year-old and I'm in a group with other parents and their kids. And you can see that the parents are like afraid of their children. They don't want to (laughs) Thing. They don't want to be like, hey, knock it off. That's not cool, you know? And their kids are run amok. They are little brats. They are so, and they are so annoying. And you're just like, dude, you have to socialize. They're animals. Yeah. You socialize them. And I mean, I, it's not that I feel that way about parenting, like overall. I mean, I'm very respectful and all that. But at the same time, you know, you got to be the authoritative figure in your kid's life. And these kids don't have that. And it, like, they don't have that from society and they don't have that in their own lives. Well, I mean, and let me, I'm sorry to jump in here because I'm a mother too and I'm aware of this. But the thing is that I always remember when my kids were young, I always remember reading, I don't know where the read, I read this or heard this, but it was, um, I was taught somehow that children crave boundaries, boundaries and guidelines. Thinking about that after reading this book, after our discussion last night on the uh, Brave New World, I remember thinking, is, is that true for us as human adults? that we crave those kind of structures in society. Because when the structures break down, like they do in this book, evil and all hell breaks loose. And we can't handle that. We can't control it. Back to that basic question, right? Whether you're sort of like the, who is it? The Hobbes, nasty, brutish, and short guy, or the, what's the other guy? Is it Rawls? You know, that's sort of got the... Yeah, I'm embarrassed. I don't know this off the top of my head. Uh, Rousseau or a lot coming uh, to mind. Guy that believes in sort of the the noble savage. Yeah, Rousseau for sure. Rousseau, sorry. Um, you know, it's like, do you believe in one or the other? Do you think that we're inherently good, or do you think that we're inherently evil and we require, you know, these sort of rules and guidelines? I I do think that's a question in there, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure if he's really asking that or if he's telling us what he thinks and he's coming down on the side of, you know, we need to be, I guess, socialized. I'm always wary of these kinds of uh, arguments when they pertain to adults because I feel they have a right wing tendency to justify like, oh, you know, why would you have we should all work 12 hours a day, seven days a week, because that's a good, you know, regular protocol exactly. and society would break down otherwise. Right. And I think I mean, at least in this book, it, the only people I think he explicitly discusses working are his parents who seem very miserable. I think they have to take like drugs just to fall asleep. Yeah, well, I think there was a like working status for adults where everybody had to work in order to get their pittance or something like that. So I I get the sense that there was like a work a day London with a seedy youth mad under like belly night. And it was like raw and dangerous, you know, uh, and then it was uh, like a bustling, like functioning well enough. You know, it wasn't London in like the times of like the Ripper or whatever. Just you don't want to go out at night. What was the form of government? My sense was that. It was more, you know, and this, you know, there was a 60s labor government, and my sense was that it was quasi socialism in England, but just yeah. maybe a, a little bit more developed. Yeah, it wasn't totalitarian because they needed his buy in, like they needed him right. to, like they needed the people. 
However, there was one, uh, I actually don't know, I'm just thinking out the top of my head, uh, there was that one scene, I think, in part two, where they mentioned that the, the prisons will soon be used for political prisoners. And also, of course, like, we, we see that the cops are corrupted, and I think by part three, they mentioned that, like, doing this kind of violence is a lot more dangerous because there's more cops, and they give as good as they get. Yeah, and the whole thing that really brought the crime around by the part three was that they had hired so many thugs to be cops to fight thugs as cops. At that they just hire that they just had a thug cop force now. and there wasn't any crime because all the cops were thugs. What's the deal with how does Burgess's actual politics play into this, if at all? He was a fairly right wing guy. He like spent after he became rich, he became like a tax exile from late from the high labor taxes and he went to like Monaco or something. And uh, I don't know what if anything it has to do with this book but i think that was after this book right and also yeah. he hated the movie he hated kubrick's movie and he also resented the fact that this book got all the attention and and he it was his least liked book of all the books he wrote i, I wonder i read I that um, while he was doing while he was writing this book this was the same time that they were using um this kind of behavioral therapy to try to do gay conversions like this was the time that that was happening and i thought you know he obviously seems to be against that so i wonder like what does right wing mean when he was like in the 60s or whatever whenever this was written so you said uh, so he's obviously against that i think implying that he's obviously against the ludovico technique in this story is that is that what you're saying well yeah that he's yeah. Well, that's true. Because I wonder, but no, 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 I know. I'm just trying to make clear what it was you were saying because I just wondered about that assumption. Does he think that the Ludovico technique is wrong? I think, I don't know that he, I think that he, what he believes, it seems like what he believes from my point of view is that, you know, good is only good if you make it because it's a choice that you have the, seems to be saying that over and over and over. Yeah, and that's very clear. We're, we're getting, you know, we're getting into other layers of it in terms of good, but like just the basic outline is it doesn't count unless you're choosing to do it. And can I be nitpicky about that and just yeah. say, I, I think we can eliminate the whole free choice, free will argument if we say um, exactly what you said, but not if you choose to do it, but if you identify with the act. Oh, well, now I've got it. Uh, now I need maybe to understand this distinction. Maybe you don't agree with no, that. I just need to understand that distinction no, myself. I, actually don't, I don't understand it either, so carry well, on. I, well, I, I just think like, uh, you know, there's a contention about what free will means means and how we you know square our science deterministic laws of nature with free will and i think we can get around that and this issue that i think is clearly portrayed in this novel as far as alex having been subjected to a sort of therapy that his own mind revolts and rejects and his body is doing certain things that he does not consider to be part of himself yeah anymore. that's because mm. it's not like he he does the therapy and then all of a sudden he just does good stuff he sees a woman and the first thing he says oh i should rape her and then like he he has a feeling of disgust he's like ah, uh, yeah, you you know. yeah. But, yeah. But, but to be honest like if someone really had that desire wouldn't that be a good response like, shouldn't you feel like if you, if you honestly want to do something that horrible, shouldn't you immediately feel disgust? And like, I look, I have nieces uh, and a nephew. Uh, I hope to have kids one day. I don't have kids yet. And, you know, at least with my niece, and nephew, a brother and sister, they fight all the time and they fight like the USSR and the USA during the Cold War. And like, it's ridiculous and just over the stupidest stuff and everything to them is like a new opportunity for power struggle. So everything is like Vietnam and Afghanistan and it's like they, it, it, everything yeah. is, is like a zero sum game for them. And I just have to be like, like there's just some element of telling them you can't do this. Like you can't, I don't know. You have to shape their emotions to some extent. Like what you are doing is a horrible thing. Just think about how you're making the other one feel at this moment. And you should feel disgusted with what you've done. <laughs> like, and I don't say, like maybe the government is too heavy handed in what it's doing. Yeah, that's the problem I have with, or that I guess Burgess had as well, is that when, when he sees that woman, when he comes out and he's like, you know, immediately thinks he wants to rape her and then he gets all nauseous and everything and you're like well of course what well, you don't you want to have that feeling um when you think of doing something horrible and yes of course you do except this was created and visited upon him by the government it's what not difference a difference does it make 
I feel like the the book directly responds to this point. Yeah, yeah exactly. by the music, right? Because, like, the music is such a fuck-up. Sorry, Cesar. No, no, this, but also just exactly what you said, Daniel. Um, I have a quote here, page 86. You felt ill this afternoon, he said, because you're getting better. When we're healthy, respond to the presence of hateful with fear and nausea. You're becoming healthy, that's all. Like, exactly what you said is that they're trying to turn him into a person who we deem as acceptable and good in society that re revolts against these kind of violent, awful acts. Yeah, but that's not nature. That's not humanity. That's not pro right. That's wrong. I guess my, my point is just that, I mean, maybe there, I would say as a matter of practicality and, you know, knowing that big government bureaucracies sometimes are rather problematic, that it's probably not a good idea to have the government be in charge of socializing people that, you know, it's better to have, try to have parents or, you know, just people in the community or something like that religious figures, all this kind of stuff, try to socialize people instead. And I recognize that that might be the problem. But that's just largely a matter of practicality, though. That's just a matter of, you know, it's kind of, it's pro always problematic to have, you know, these big kind of government bureaucracies that tend to get a little bit dumb because they can, they don't really have enough to push back on them. But I don't think it's a wrong in principle to take away, in a sense, people's freedom of choice to do bad things. Cause I, look, I don't feel like I have a freedom of choice to do bad things. Like if I start doing a bad thing, I don't enjoy it. Like I, who cares if I'm not able to enjoy doing bad things? Yeah, like if they, that's that... free will, like that's screw uh, then yeah. I don't know. I mean like do I not have free will then? The problem yes, is that like the sorry. I wanted to hit this from a left wing perspective, because maybe or, or a criticism of a potential left wing perspective where you could say, okay, you don't have the free will to do the bad thing, but maybe maybe Daniel, you uh are not good enough of a comrade therefore we have to you know put you in a re-education re camp to make you the good comrade that you by your own free will should be right right it would you be too much extend? right well yeah the point being that but the thing is is that if for some reason i slipped out of it i would want people to bring me back to a state where i did not want to do bad things anymore right like i would hope that my parents or whoever would intervene i mean it's such a powerful influence that i think the real issue is that we don't want to give that right to the government because the government's going to have its own you know there's no such thing as a government made up of angels right and you, you know it's it's a it's a highly problematic thing to give all that power to one group of people and but that's the real issue there's no problem with you know socializing people to hate cruelty to feel disgusted with cruelty like that's what we do all the time and all of you are socialized to hate cruelty like be real you don't really have like the free will to just do a bunch of horrible stuff like a psychopath yeah, but I think that that's what Burgess was, key, you know, pointing into here, which is that he was attacking that pure sense of free will. I mean, and that is in many ways frightening when you think about that, okay, we've been conditioned, we're continuing to be conditioned. And I think he brought it to a sort of more extreme, maybe, um, and maybe this may be going on in prisons as we speak, but he br brought it into a very extreme, frightening scenario where Alex is reconditioned in a very brutal way. And it's, it's a real frightening thing to me to think that that element of pure free will can and is ruined this way. The, the bottom line is that humanity, the human existence, human beings are made up of good and evil. It's just the way it is. That exists within us. Look at all the wars that we continually have and the destruction, the physical destruction that we have done over millennia and continue to do. This is us, our nature. And I, even though I, it just abhors me, I don't, I really am scared to death to be manipulated in any way to not have that freedom of choice. Although I understand I may have already been manipulated. I'm continuing to be manipulated, but still, I think that's what, what's coming out. That's what Burgess is saying here. He's saying this is a horror. The true evil isn't that we rape or, you know, murder or whatever, or make that choice or, or do that. The true evil is our ability to choose to either do that or not do that being taken away. That's the true evil. That's the guy my doing the raping and killing. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my concern is more 
it's probably, you know, at various points in the book that there's a suggestion made that somehow the capacity to do evil is intimately linked with the ability to make it appreciate art and, you know, the, the finer things in life, the excellences, the, you know, whether it's being good in sports or all the things that, you know, we admire in people, all that stuff maybe wouldn't be possible unless you had an aggressive side if, unless you had, you know, a certain amount of evil. And but that's also like you need to the point of that is that you would want to sublimate it right into art or something. And How? it's weird. Alex can't. Alex isn't good at isn't terribly good at sublimating. I mean, I realize that he appreciates art, but there's no sub. It strikes me that there's little or no sublimating going on by anyone in this book. And I don't know. I mean, maybe well, that's by the, the problem. Third act. I mean, but the third act though i think you do get that uh, i mean th that people have matured and that there's not sublimation hasn't begun yet we're like in zero you know like this is the proto phase that gets sublimated well i would disagree i would think that you know it's more like he's just losing his strong aggressive desires that's what I mean to say by proto the first self the 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 banal evil of children that's what i mean before you're governed by higher thought or consideration or something but yeah uh, please if you get a quote oh well i was just thinking of the fact that he started to like leader uh, i was sluicing this is the only quote i had in mind i was sluicing more like malinky romantic songs what they call leader just a gloss and a piano very quiet and yearning different from when i it had been all bullshit orchestras and me lying on the bed between the violins and the trombones and the kettle drums i mean his change in taste of music uh to you know the chopins of the world and the schuberts of the world strikes me as an indication that you know his underlying desires are changing and that he's just getting to be less he's he's, he's losing his fangs right and there's nothing sublimating you need that the, the idea of sublimating is like you need the horrible aggressive drives in order to divert that you know raging river into something else whereas what he's saying is that well i used to have a raging river and now it's just kind of become a creek or something i this is i think this is a very important point i i feel like this is my uh favorite takeaway from the book and it kind of responds to your point as as far as like what are the burgess's politics i very much read him to be super right wing uh, and I feel that his overall take on um, art and creation in general, uh, especially as exposed by the quote you just said, are that high art and the evolution of art only comes through these things that live outside the borders of society. And you'll yeah. notice the NatSat speak itself is in the purview of these gangs. And when Pete leaves the gangs, he drops the NatSat and the silly you know, little girl that they portray to be his future wife you know, doesn't even understand it. But this is the eloquent speech that we get through at the book, along with the clothing, along with, uh, of course, all the horrible violence and all that stuff. And it's juxtaposed against the silly bourgeoisie who are, you know, working um, nine to five or whatever their working hours are. And it includes the old man who they beat up and he's reading some, I don't even remember the book, but it was like the most ridiculous title of, uh, of all time. Like Christology. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and especially, of course, the juxtaposition of the quote that you read, he goes from Beethoven, Ode to Joy, to Lieder, which are just, you know, small songs in, in German, as he loses his oomph. Yeah, and I, I can't pull up the quote right now, but I just want to point out, the guy who was writing that book, The Clockwork Orange, um, as a sort of polemic against the government and all these horrible things that they're doing people and taking away free choice and stuff like that that person is not positively portrayed whatsoever and it just strikes me as weird that there's this you know he's almost almost like a quasi authorial figure and he's just made fun of in the book as this schmuck as, as this guy who uh has a lot of silly ideas about liberty. Okay, this is the quote that I'm looking for. You know, he's, uh, Alex is just attacking this guy, and he's looking at the book that the guy has written, A Clockwork Orange. And then I, re this is, okay, Alex has said, and then I read a Malinky bit out loud in a sort of very high, high preaching gloss. The attempt to impose 
upon man, a creature of growth and capable of sweetness to ooze juicily at the last round the bearded lips of God, uh, to attempt to impose, I say, laws and conditions appropriate to a mechanical creation. Against this, I raise my sword pen. And it's ridiculous, right? Like, and then he's, Alex comments, yeah. Dim, Dim made old lip music, which is like, <laughs> at that. And <laughs> had, I had to smack myself. If the, if the point of this book is, you know, hooray for free will, it's kind of funny that uh, that seems to be, you know, that the the surrogates in the novel who voice this view are not themselves very positively portrayed. Yeah, I mean, that character gets his own story because his wife is murdered. And then though he is adamant about human, you know, his ideals, he becomes a torturer, right, playing that music. So that's yeah. that link that we talked about. So that's really interesting, you know, but he doesn't really stand in so much for the, like you said, quasi, that was a good word for it, because it just brings up the titular notion, but it's not some kind of Michel, uh, oh, who's that guy that, that we like, uh, the French author. Anyway, he doesn't introduce himself as a character only to get murdered violently. Would, yeah, exactly. But uh, I, I mean, it just does bring up the notion that like, I think that that idea is less married to him than maybe if we're taking him as an ultra right wing, looking at like, you know, the, the left, you know, uh, article writing New York Times, you know, subscribing article writer and thinking that his ideas don't really hold up in the real world of someone he lost personally were, you know, taken away from him. Um, I, I do think that his polit like Burgess's actual politics is what Cesare was just kind of suggesting that, you know, there is some sense that he is worried that the you know the sort of mechanization that would come from the left wing would somehow squelch out something in human beings i'm guessing that's what he's really kind of concerned about it's like a road to serfdom kind of concern that i think that burgess has for better or worse yeah and i think that this is getting back to something so there's a lot out here but i wanted to kind of get at this you know argument because i think that your position a little bit before daniel was you know uh free will be damned um i'll live with the uh, clockwork oranges all around me so long as there's not murder right and you might uh, happily live in an authoritarian like happy place right but the argument of the book is clearly against that Though it, we might look at something like, yeah, you know, if you could vaccinate against evil and it worked, you know, if this were a science fiction story and it did a better job, it just did what it needed to do and we didn't have to go into it, you know, it wasn't, it was something more than like mere Pavlovian conditioning and, you know, uh, this worked out, you know, it might be a different kind of a story. We might look at this, um, but it doesn't work out and he ends up. I mean, we kind of talk about the last chapter because it doesn't seem like we're convinced at what actually is stated to have happened. I mean, the author himself says that this guy turns around and that, you know, he does kind of like want children and people around him have grown up. And it does seem like he's saying something about how life works out and maybe we shouldn't meddle with science. Um, maybe that was a terrible detour. And that's what we want to talk about. Like people on their own will find a way, you know, Jurassic Park. Can, can we do maybe a quick uh, just... Because I read the uh, I read the interpretation of the last chapter, and I had not caught that on my you know solo reading, so I reread the the last chapter, and uh, this is what I thought happened. And tell me if I'm wrong. So Alex has a new gang. He goes and does the violent things that he does, but he feels sick of it, so he goes to the bar. They order a round of scotches, and they order a round of scotches for the uh, seemingly homeless women that always just get uh, free drinks from them. Yeah, they're alibi ladies. But he, you know, this is an interesting right wing point that he, uh, for me, he so he's like, why should I buy them free alcohol? Like we're doing all this work, we earned our keep, and then his gang members are saying, like, what do you mean earned? Like we stole and killed for this money. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe that's an aside but um this happens he decides to get a beer instead of a scotch and then they pull out a picture from well it's like a picture of a baby that he cut out of the newspaper they make fun of it tear it up he walks he decides that you know i'm not in the mood uh goes home for the night meet pete see pete with his without his nat said speak and his new wife and then like kind of thinks of what it would be like to have a child and what do we teach that child and how incomprehensible be for him to tell him anything because he'd likely be implicated in the same um, census cycle of violence? Well, the, 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 the interesting thing, he suggests that 
perhaps the child is going to go through this whole, you know, that he's that the child is going to be just as bad as as he is. And that there's a quote towards my son, my son, when I had my son, I would explain all that to him when he was uh, starry enough to like understand it. But where the hell is it? Oh, he thinks of a robot. This is what he thinks. This is his view of humans. Okay. He's talking about a robot. You, one of those Malinky toys that he's being sold in the streets, little, like little, uh, Chelovics made out of tin and with a spring inside and then a winding handle on the outside. And you wind it up, gur, gur, gur. And off it itties like walking. Oh, my brothers. And it itties in a straight line and it bangs straight into things, bang, bang, and it cannot help what it's doing. Being young, he's he's making a comparison between this sort of robot. You've probably seen a little toy robot like this, and he's and with children and with human beings. Being young is like being like one of these Malenki machines. And then in the next paragraph, it goes into some other stuff, but like he has an odd vision of God. Like some gigantic, uh, like old bog, i.e. God himself, turning and turning and turning a Vani Grasny orange in his gigantic rookers. It's like this vision of God. It's, it's a personification of God that I think kind of suggests the nature of causation itself. Like God turning the world with his own hands and the world is like a big orange. And he's saying that, I think he's basically saying that humans are clock are are the oranges are the clockwork oranges already or something Maybe. i mean i think that's a suggestion by saying by referring to the world as an orange I just have one small point, but and maybe this is way too extra textual, but the Slavic word for work is uh, robota, robot. That's actually where the, oh, really? etymology, the etymology of the English word for robot is from the Slavic of uh, work. That's awesome. I'm so happy that you're with us to explain that today. That's, that's, uh, that's really good. Um, uh, but uh, Daniel, I think that I see... So I think that I see something that's very different based on both of those things, but I might, but it might not be. So just to be clear, though, the robotic mechanism that he's talking about, the metaphor he's talking about with the toy robot is not the same as the metaphor of a clockwork orange, right? We're clear about that. I'm not sure that there, I, I, I yes, literally, but obviously, you know, a robot is a clockwork thing. Oh, okay. So, but so, so my takeaway from that was that he he had this entirely different metaphor that I see, rather than um, that we're all a giant god clock. So the toy he was talking about, just so I don't have the the text in front of me. the The idea of the wind up boy was that he was set forth with these urges, and that that was the driving mechanism, and that he had these urges and he would bump into things as he did in society. And that was whatever. And then God above was turning in his hands the orange, but it wasn't a clockwork orange. It was just orange again to define the human flesh. And that was his son being imbued with this energy, which is quite different from, I mean, this is the state that maybe he doesn't even realize that he's in, but we have been talking about this where it's some kind of like evolving psychopathy towards maturation or something. It's the human energy being moved around and like maturing and losing some of it as time goes on and being like having like, you know, stores of evil in them as everybody does. If, if I'm getting all these metaphors together and that, that energy is actually the robot, but it's not as if those are clockwork oranges themselves that don't have um, free will. It's just that they have a drive and they're enacting on that drive um, and bumping into things. But I, I think it's a separate uh, consideration than being, determined it's more like this is the it's it's a it, so it's a generalization versus something that like everything is uh sketched out for you like you have to do these things i mean i i'm not sure what the difference would be between having a drive telling me to do something and it's the free but, but that's what i'm saying it's the crux it's anthony burgess's crux it's the free choice thing so like the drive is like you can have evil in you and then do something with it like he's worried about setting off this and like him just like bumping around and like not being able to do anything like with it but it's quite different from being programmed and and, and like a programmed machine is different from like a driven entity and i think that we've been focusing on yeah i, I think so because the entity can uh, become more complicated. 
stamp program machine become more complicated? No, not without programming further. Not without further programming. Uh, wait, there's a line here. I guess this is when he has met Alexander, you remember, F. Alexander? Alexander says to him, they have turned you into something other than a human being. You have no power of choice any longer. You are committed to socially acceptable acts. A little machine capable only of good. And I see that clearly, that business about the marginal conditionings, music and the sexual act, literature and art, all must be a source now, not of pleasure, but of pain. And then a little further down, he says, but the essential intention is man who cannot choose ceases to be a man. Yeah, and so it's very different from having drive to do things and having the potential versus having to execute a fate. You know, that's what I think the distinction is. The key, the focus, the, the most important part of it is the choice. Not what you choose, What it doesn't matter. And he's that's worried about the drives leading his child down the same path. So like whether or not you have the choice, you're still going to have the drives. The, this guy still has the drives, but he doesn't have the choice to do back on. You know what I mean? So it's a different situation. Um, the, the drives are irrespective. Let's agree that we're all going to have evil in us and the potential for good. And then from there, you know, it gets a little bit more interesting um, because how do you funnel that? And arguably all this stuff is a failure of culture. Like it's just a massive bad way to get along living in the society and government is trying to govern it. And, you know, the religious argument is trying to do something, you know, maybe just ultra conservative and always try and get everybody to do this basic routine or whatever. Um, but there's, there's definitely struggles for how to get along with everybody. Yeah, I wanna go back to one quote, just see what you guys thought about it. You were not put on this earth just to get in touch with God. That sort of thing could sap all the strength and the goodness out of a Chalabek. I don't know, I think that's um, an interesting statement because yeah, I almost want to uh, juxtapose it with uh, this quote that just says, uh, he ceases to be a creature capable of moral choice. These are subtleties, like smiled Dr. Brodsky. We are not concerned with motive, with higher ethics. We are concerned only with cutting down crime. I think that ties down with uh, just what you said, <laughs> where we uh, juxtapose some sort of, you know, ineffable high motive with a simple pragmatic thing of cutting down crime. Yeah, and jumping off of that, we can think that really Burgess's hope is unattainable. Also, I, I just I didn't mean to uh, cut off your point, Jennifer, in case you had some other uh, aspect, uh, religious angle on this book, which I really didn't see. I feel like this was very devoid of, of that angle. No, I, what, what's interesting to me, and I'm going to try to get this out without coffee, is that all of this reminds me a lot of the psychology that was really very popular at the time, which, which was B.F. Skinner, behavioral psychology, and all that was happening with that. And I don't know where he lands, but the question, you know, I think there's a really interesting quote from Skinner somewhere that it's like, you know, I don't really care what you think or I'm not, you know, what you think or what you feel inside is neither here nor there. It's really what you do that matters. And I think this is, um, this is just calling that into question. I'm not sure what he's really saying in all of this. I don't know where he lands or if he's making a statement or if he's just sort of bringing to light sort of all of the complexity that goes along with morality, which is, you know, is it how you feel when you do something? Because a lot of times we will identify with people and become empathic toward their situation, even when they do things that are really wrong. And then in the times that we don't, you know, that causes problems too. So I think it's complicated. It's, uh, your point is interesting because I, I promise I didn't read any secondary literature, but randomly I had um, just listened to a podcast that included Noam Chomsky uh, before this. And he had mentioned that the entire behavioralist um, research program was entirely flawed because in his opinion, they were kind of studying the readings of social phenomena rather than trying to get to the social phenomena themselves. And I think that's a big yeah. kind of conflict that we've been having uh, this entire time as far as like I uh, like you just mentioned uh, Jennifer do we care about the thing in itself or do we just care about the behavior that results from it <laughs> yeah and I think he points out I mean what happened to Alex after he received that treatment was not only that he couldn't commit acts of violence but that he couldn't defend himself and he was at a real disadvantage so there are some problems with the approach no matter w what your opinion is right i'm not sure that he reads to me completely as right wing but in the sense that you know we shouldn't interfere with 
the complex way that we've become human, that see, like, no matter what our problems are, no matter how bad society may get, that, like, that is not the answer. So what is the deal with, you know, the guy, you know, so he killed Ryder's wife, right? And by happenstance, you know, and the, he, you know, comes across the writer again, and the writer decides to kind of use him as a, a sort of example. Af- after he's been conditioned, the writer wants to use him as like an example of why the government is so bad in taking away people's free choice, right? Questionable if that's by happenstance, right? Because it's Sim and uh, Billy Boy that bring him there. Well, so one thing I'm wondering then is, was that a sort of trap for the writer? Like, because he, they would, he would know, I mean, the conspiratorial view might be something like this, feel free to suggest something else, that the government knew that there was this dissident guy who had this horrible history with Alex. And so, you know, they effectively make it so that they drop Alex off and he eventually discovers it. And he, uh, you know, shows himself and he'll, he'll eventually try to do something horrible to Alex. And then you can, you know, discredit the the Liberty guy. You can get him. Yeah. That might be the case. I wonder that that's true. Well, that, that was certainly my reading. I mean, I think the government is showing to be a bad thing, or maybe that's just my internal biases, but they're showing that the resistance to the government is just as bad, and you may want to identify with them as a more progressive version of it, but they're just showing that, you know, progressive causes use humans as tools rather than view them as individuals. Were they using Alex as a tool or were they using him as an individual or was like, what do we think about the defenders of liberty here in this book? I would, uh, I was going to say 100%, but I'm going to leave some room open to be convinced otherwise. 100% using Alex as a tool to advance their cause. Their motivation for conditioning Alex, then, what is the government's motivation if, if they're doing what you just said and they're also conditioning Alex, who is this, you know, sort of, you know, why not just lock him up? Who cares? Why invest all this time? Because the prisons were getting full and they're not working. And I think they explicitly said they were only, they were only teaching criminals to become better criminals or something like that, you know. Cheaper to give people a conscience or to, to make to make it them incapable of doing bad acts. Right. I mean, it'd be it'd be it'd be better if people just didn't do bad stuff and you wouldn't have to house them in prison. <laughs> like that's basically the cost benefit analysis. And that's true. So then how does that go along with I, I guess I'm just trying to marry those two ideas because I don't I felt yeah. like it was serendipitous what happened with the writer, with the author. That might be the case. I did also I don't know. It, it seemed explained it. Well go ahead, Laura. I was just gonna say he didn't know at the time that Alex was the one that killed his wife, right? No, he didn't. He got tipped off and he changed his personality yeah, when he learned exactly. it. Exactly. So even if you make the argument that the government sort of dropped Alex off, right? But then I think it was also a chance meeting of Dim and the other guy. And it was explained that the he lives on the outside of town where people get dropped off. Okay. Yeah, that's a lot of coincidence. But it, it seems it seems very convenient for the government then to discredit the defenders of liberty because of this guy's unique reaction to Alex in particular. And well, it was just a I political mean, opportunity, right? Like they were using him as a tool and then there's an incident and then they came in and, and, and then decided to use him in turn. Yeah. What does it say that, okay, if the defenders of liberty are themselves using Alex as a tool, like, isn't that... Why not though? Like, isn't, isn't that like ironic? altruistic or like why? I don't know. So I, if, if it's a good faith thing where they think something bad is happening and they found somebody where something bad has happened to and they want to use this person to address that issue, just like a lawsuit or something like that. Why yeah. is that? Why, why is that not? Yeah, yeah. Why not? Now, I yeah. mean, if it's imperfect and they actually don't have, they have maybe bad plans for him, you know, or maybe don't care what happens to him. But it doesn't. I mean, they do want to use him, but that also seems like this is what you would use a person for is like to stop it if you believe that it should be stopped. And that's a sincere belief. Right. I mean, to some extent, I'm, I'm sympathetic with, you know, despite all my trash talking of uh, free will and choice, like I, you know, I am basically sympathetic to the, you know, traditions of, 
the traditions, there are great traditions of liberty to defend, right? Like, okay, fine, I am sympathetic to these great traditions of liberty to defend that the author refers to. And I just find it funny that this guy gets trashed then. I mean, he got trashed earlier in the book, like with that quote about raising my sword pen, and now he's getting trashed again as as kind of a, a hypocrite or something. I, You know, he, that basically... He wants to punish Alex. I mean, okay, Nietzsche. Remember Nietzsche? <laughs> Remember how he was like, people like to believe in free will because they just want to be able to blame someone, right? And I don't know. I mean, that's kind of what came to my mind. I don't know if that's being suggested here, but this guy really wants to blame this guy, Alex. The author wants to get his revenge against Alex personally. And... You know, a lot of these things in the book, there's a lot of the justice, the the sections where Alex gets his comeuppance. Uh, Why do we want to get comeuppance? It's because we think we think people have free wills and we want them to suffer for the horrible things that they've done to us. Right. So, I mean, how can I just bring that perspective to bear that, you know, punishment, punishment as opposed to rehabilitation is premised on the idea that people have free wills and, you know, they, they deserve what they're getting. I'm not sure if I'm getting what your problem is. Is it that you do not, you're not a fan of free will? I mean, I'm skeptical of the way that people use free will. I think that every crooked prosecutor in the world paints this picture of, of are you a prosecutor? You know, of a, no, prosecutor? no, I'm not, but I'm saying that like we punish because, you know, we think that people have free will. I think that is true. And that as opposed to taking a rehabilitative view of things that, well, maybe this kid didn't have the best parents in the world and that they didn't, he didn't have, you know, good social circumstances. He wasn't really given a chance to, you know, have a good path in life and he got, you know, got in with the wrong people. You know, you could take that view of criminals, but, you know, when you want to punish someone, you don't think of all that stuff. You think this person, screw him. Uh, you know, he he screwed me over. He decided to do bad things to me. And so now I'm going to punish him. And that's the whole last third of the book. is That's what it's concerned. Like over and over, you, you there are people who are like pissed off at Alex because of all the horrible things that he did. And they're getting their own revenge they're getting their own justice right yeah, the old man um, up, right? <laughs> yeah and i mean bringing in nietzsche might be bringing in a foreign idea um but i at least was reminded of the fact that I, it's interesting that this sort of remedy ultimately wouldn't work in any real way in part because people would demand to get their own punishment, right? Like people want to believe that there's free. I mean, also think of, I'm also thinking about the legal debates with regards to the insanity defense and how incredibly narrow the insanity defense is. Can you just unpack the Nietzsche thing? Because I think you mentioned that people want to believe in free will because they want to blame someone else. I wish I had something to pull up right now. This is just the the basic, but there's a basic idea in Nietzsche, probably in Beyond Good and Evil and the genealogy of morals that, you know, basically our idea of where a conscience comes from, it kind of like a need to think that people somehow made a choice and therefore they're responsible for their choice and therefore we we can't just forget what they did. We have to positively get justice to kind of set so things right. This is kind of his like will to power and it's a kind of a post hoc thing for us to implant choice into the matter. But it's the metaphysical will to power thing that he's talking about. Well, he's saying that that we 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 justice is we 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 want to punish because of resentment, right? We we feel all this. We get screwed over. We can't just treat it. We're not content to just treat it as uh, something crummy happened to me. We have to. We we want to get a sort of revenge. Um, and you know, we invent an idea that such and such person somehow metaphysically, you know, had a choice and decided to do this. And that's why, you know, we now have a right to go punish this person. I think that's the idea that Nietzsche was was getting at. 
It seems like in that telling that Alex is just one who is just better at living the life in a certain society than other people, though, right? Like, if you happen to get killed or raped by Alex, tough on you, right? <laughs> I mean, maybe it's consistent what he did. I mean, the the defender of liberty, the the author, what's his name, F. Alexander. I mean, if he believes that people have free will, then he was, from his own perspective, in a sense, I mean, maybe it was outside the bounds of law and he shouldn't do it for that reason, but... You know, he would really think that Alex should be punished because of his positive choice to do this horrible, all these horrible things, to kill his wife, to rape and kill his wife, right? I mean, in that sense, maybe F. Alexander is good, right? Maybe he's good in the sense that this is a world where criminals aren't giving their proper punishment, and F. Alexander is giving Alex the punishment that he deserves. Another thing, what what the... What the hell is the deal with naming him F. Alexander when the protagonist is named Alex? I really wonder about that. Well, Well, maybe they could have been each other. That's the other thing. I mean, he notices it himself that that's another Alex. He says it's another Alex. Well, that goes back to my crazy idea that this book is painting a picture of people as not being automatons. <laughs> I don't know. I, I I know that sounds like horrible, but like that's I, I think that's where my reading of the book comes out. And I kind of think that Burgess is... Well, if there are automatons is, who have the ability to do good or bad things, but that doesn't seem like an automaton. But the thing is, is that you have design... I mean, it would be odd. Okay. The, the basic idea being here is that if you do good things, it's because you're impelled to do good things. If you do bad things, if you have the desire to be to do bad things, if if for some reason, you know, you can do both good and bad things, you know, you have both desires, which is, you know, of course, probably what people are. No, that's what's going on. A, and that's what the author believes. The other thing is what Alex believes. And I think that's like, that's not what the story is saying, though. Like Alex's assumption is that it's just like these like preferences between the two, but it's not that simple. And like the story knows it. That's possible. I mean, so let's let's think about this just a little bit. So we have both of a desire. We have both a desire to do good and bad things. Right. Go on. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, while I have the capacity to say, I'm I think you're noticing that Alexander and Alex is important because I think those two characters serve as a foil for each other. When you think about Alex, he's a really smart guy, right? He does. It's very clear throughout the book that he's not interested in being seen as intelligent, but that he is very smart. Mm -hmm. Whereas Alexander is very different. You know, he is an intellectual in a lot of ways. And I think Alexander, he sort of represents the idea that we're good, yet we can be corrupted by the state. And the other Alex is the character who is, I would say, represents the idea of just like inherent evil, inherently bad. So I think they're just, they juxtapose each other and they they bring out all of these questions that we're bringing out. I'm just unsure when we talk about Anthony Burgess and where he, he lands on that opinion. I don't think it's clear. I think it's a lot of questions up in the air about which one he really believes in or which one he thinks is true. I don't know. What do you, Wait, what is do you it, mean? So is this a distinction again? Are we, are we still uh, in the binary mode or the mixed mode of, are we still trying to distinguish if it's like he's saying that there's like good and evil or that there's a mix? I'm sorry. I feel like that's still like on the table. And well, I feel I, like yeah. the story actually comes. Like, so there's this one little part in the early section where Dim looks up at the stars and he's like, oh, wow, I wonder what's up there. And then like he's and Alex is like, don't don't worry about that, stupid. Focus on other things. And he, and he is an idiot and a brute. But then he like looks at him and then like looks back up and like has just this little moment, you know. And to me, that's like the you know, like the yin yang symbol, it's like the mostly dark, but that's the spot of white. Like that's the crack through which anything good in his life can spread from. And what we see inverted in that with F. Alexander is that he actually has like a life that's fairly stable and nice. But then what happens is is that we see these yin yang flip around, right? Some people like Pete is the clearest example of someone who smooths out and becomes a decent guy. And F. Alexander goes dark because he lost something and he loses his ideals intellectually for uh, emotional things. So we can see that mirroring happening there. But like and both I, of those yeah. require that two things are going on and changing within a person. And it's not just a slip of a binary switch somewhere. 
Yeah, I think that's right. I think because you you see his friends and you're right, you have Pete who goes on to become good and then you have other characters who kind of continue on that bad path. And I think that these characters just are that question. Like they just represent that question for me. Alex is the sort of, we are inherently evil or we have original sin or however you want to say that. And then F. Alexander is the guy who is, we are good. Basically, we're the noble savage or whatever, but we can be corrupted by society and whatever. So I think that what Alex is saying is not what's going on. So he says it's like, you know, people are just like all bad and like I'm choosing bad. Like that's what he is saying, but that's not what's going on with him, I believe. I think that it's evident in how he, whenever he punches Dim, what was that? Right? Like, I think that was his looking up at the stars moment. Like, it was this beautiful singing that he didn't want interrupted with some brute talking about, like, through his gob about, like, cheese or whatever it was. But that, yeah. That, that, was the, that was the artistic thing I can't connect to this entire story, right? That's to what me, I'm saying. The most powerful thing is that, like, um, we're all here discussing a work of art, and this directly implicates us as non moral beings, or at best, amoral beings, or at best, non moral beings. I don't know what you would call it, but how could a creature like Alex truly find joy in Beethoven, right? It's also like, you know, that was a moment, but, you know, nobody is so consistent. Even good people are bad sometimes, but even bad people are good sometimes. Like, it's just going to happen. Well, I, I guess I, it wasn't that he liked the music. I just want to be clear on, like, the point, because I know you guys talked about about this moment earlier and that his affinity for music and like how that's tied into taste and personal character but that's not what i'm talking about there it was the that my my reading of it anyway maybe this is off is that it was the indecency of interrupting it wasn't that like you know whether or not he liked it or not it was that this guy was being an ass and that was the that was the pinpoint of light that i think that will spread into him like being able to look back on things but like that was the beginning of like a line a ceiling somewhere where like we don't do this we do all these other things but like we shut up whenever something nice is on and that is the first good standard like that i think blooms later or is the only thing like that's the sign of good and oh. not just being banal I, i'm completely thinking on my feet here and i just want to throw out a quick point because um this just happens to to intersect with some things i've been thinking about lately isn't this kind of like when we hear about some for me far left critiques of current political standards whereas for instance it's okay to uh, accept war and millions of people dying or millions of people having a lack of health insurance or millions of people suffering as just the standard status quo but as soon as someone um subverts norms of for instance decency and civility these are shocking moments that are brung to the light this I, i'm juxtaposing your opinion here this is not showing the morality of character but really the indecency of civility itself and indecency of art itself is what i was kind of thinking did that connect at all for anyone as far as like in the political process it's normal to talk about the necessity of war and death and murder but as soon as yeah. somebody like you know says something that's against what you expect it's it's insane <laughs> i mean i think that for me the connection i'm making when you say that is how in this story good and bad is so blurred you know it's so messy because they're doing this horrible thing to this person in order so that he does good right and the ends don't justify the means so it's blurred in that way and in in the example that you're giving it's not really a moral choice what when people do those things it's just really out of a result of not thinking about things in a way that is rational you know like you can't say that you know, kneeling whenever you ha say the Pledge of Allegiance or whatever, seeing the Star Spangled Banner is this horribly, you know, morally reprehensible thing and be okay with the fact that, you know, people are starving or whatever, you know, whatever the story is. It doesn't make sense. That's not rational. And so I think in this story, there's there's kind of there's that kind of quality to it where it's like, well, this guy is a good guy because he, you know, like F. Alexander, he's a good guy in some ways, but then he did this horrible thing. And so wait a minute. And it just gets messy and it's confusing in that way. So I don't necessarily think I, I'm not seeing maybe the complete line that you're drawing, but I see, I don't know, the irony of it. It seems to me that one of the key things that, uh, or the key thing maybe that uh, Bridges is putting forth here is it's much, much more important ability to choose versus, you know, that, that we eliminate evil. And I think it is that he's keying in on the inherent, and I'm, I'm coming off of what you just said, Jennifer, the inherent chaos of uh, humanity, of the universe. And that we have to come to some point of comfort, if we can, with chaos. I mean, the goal of society, obviously, is to 
to an imbue structure on chaos and yeah. where we have to let that go because it, it, we can't control at a certain point and to lose our pure freedom, which yes, we can all argue if it does in fact exist, but just for sake of discussion, to eliminate it is, I think, far greater uh, evil than to control it. Yeah, well, I, I would say that I I, th- I would agree that with that wholeheartedly to the extent that I think it is probably true that a lot of what we consider as good and really the highest things are really a sort of diverted or sublimated version of our of really horrible desires, right? Like, right. and in that sense, that I I that in that sense I totally agree. I suppose you really wouldn't want. Let's just let's just imagine like a, a little kid who you somehow managed to make it a perfect little kid, and he and he, you know he or she never rebels or anything like that. I mean, what you I obviously that's you know that's sort of like everyone's goal in a way, right? But like, wouldn't that be kind of horrible? <laughs> like, isn't it nice that kid that your kids are rebelling against you? Like, I know that like j- just imagine your own kids like running around screaming and can you look at that and and somehow say that's actually a good thing because you know they're learning they're they're learning about the world themselves you know i've been trashing free will the whole time when you when you were talking about that it made me think about um you know the idea of virtue ethics and how i don't know whoever it was plato whatever guy said that uh you know you, you have to be brought up well like you just can't get around that fact and I think that kind of was what went seemingly went wrong with Alex, but also, you know, the idea of we, we kind of want our kids to rebel. I think the point is that we want it to come within, right? Like as a parent, you're always walking that fine line of being an authoritative figure and imposing consequences and socializing, but you never want it to be something that they do out of fear because you know that at some point they're not going to fear you. And at some point, they're going to make decisions on their own. They're going to be out of the house. They're going to be bigger than you. They're going to have the, enough wit and you know intelligence to understand that, oh, she says no, and I can just do it anyway. Like she can't really, I can just walk out of the house when she says I'm grounded and there's nothing that she can do except for, you know, hold me hostage. So it's, you, you're just walking that fine line of saying, okay, we want this to be internal. We want it to be authentic. And we want it. We want our morality to be sort of implemented in them in a way that it becomes theirs, not that it's imposed on them. and I think it's interesting because that's the opposite of what happened with this Ludovic method or whatever yeah. it's called. And it's it's sort of a, you can't get around that. I, when I read that, there was a time in the story where I thought, oh, this is what Plato's talking about. When he's talking about, you know, you have to be brought up well. Or as Aristotle, I honestly don't know, I can't remember. But you have to be brought up well. You can't, like, yeah, you can become a good person, but that is an essential part of it, is that if you if you miss that early primary phase of having your mor- your morality groundwork laid, then you, you kind of really miss out. And then the question becomes, I think in life and in, in a global world that we live in, we're all trying to figure out, you know, are there essential moral truths? Are there things that we can all agree on? Like we don't all have the same laws. We don't all have the, same, have the same customs and we don't all have the same beliefs, but are there some like moral intuitions that are universal? And it's very hard to pin that down. If you've ever studied evolutionary morality or any of those kinds of things, very difficult to know if there are any and what they would be if they did exist. So I think this book kind of asks all those questions. I I didn't get that it, it answered them, but mm. yeah, we're hoping we're hoping that's like that people really are the mix of good and bad impulses, gener- you know, all around the world. I think to some extent, like I we're kind of I really hope that there aren't. I, what, what, okay, going back to this idea, like Alex thinks of himself as just being bad, and that's that's his own explanation for why he does bad things and it's people, convenient. you know yeah it's it is convenient and I, it does make me wonder whether you know going back to this idea of why the hell they talk this way you know you could say that yeah that alex has this mechanistic view of the world as his own sort of excuse to avoid feeling guilty for his own crimes and to avoid f- having feeling his natural impulses towards you know compassion or sympathy for the, the people that he's hurting. That it might well feels, be the case. It also feels like a rebellion because when I was reading this and I also thought about how I'm talking with my friends who have teenage kids and, you know, you can't read their text messages and try to find out about their lives because they have this lingo and you're just completely out of the loop. You have no idea what they're yeah. even talking about. It's like a bunch of acronyms and I, who knows what it is. 
Um, it's Nansat. <laughs> it's Nansat. It's like the, con, you know, and it happens with our teens. It's a private language. It's a way to um, rebel against, I think, any kind of authority. Yeah. And that's a very common part of growing up. And it's definitely makes a, it leaves a gap between, you know, these groups of people who speak this way and everyone else. And you were just talking about, I just wanted to touch on something else somebody just said about um, this sort of hedonistic, it's convenient kind of morality. And I think that is part of growing up too, which we see in the story. One way to read it, which I, it seems like we kind of leaned toward, you know, he's a psychopath and his impulses have just changed. But the idea that maybe he's just young and that, I mean, this could be just my reading because I'm a parent. But the idea is that, you know, our young require guidance. They just do. And the way you set off those little mechanical toys, you know, whichever itty they go in, whichever, however they walk, is the way that you set them off. And it's your responsibility as a, as a parent and as a society to make sure that people are set off in the right direction because we do have a sort of hedonistic and then there are some things you can't come back from like if you're a, a child that makes the kinds of mistakes that Alex did you know that your life is ruined there is no future for you in this situation it, his life wasn't ruined because it was very you know obviously he had this weird situation that happened with the vaccine and whatever but if we want to call it that but the point being that he grew up and those hedonistic pleasures after you get reached to a certain age you know certain things just are not interesting to you anymore. You're not interested in pressing other people. You're not interested in money if you have enough of it. You're not interested in so many things that you were interested in and you're looking for something that's a little bit more fulfilling, but that just comes with age. And that sort of, you know, felt like what was happening in this story. I think that's one reading. I think it's hard to say if that's an accurate one, but I, I did read it that way. So the idea was that the 21st chapter was redemptive or had a uh, turnabout, but the, uh, and now I'm just kind of like uh, paraphrasing, but the publisher in New York said that American audiences can handle the unvarnished truth or whatever, meaning some kind of like mean reality to Burgess that he thought was just kind of gross and maybe pornographic, not his words. And didn't enjoy that the arc of his narrative was stunted at the, you know, return to evil arc or whatever. And didn't have the resolution where, yeah, he'll grow out of it. Yeah. And you know what's interesting to me about that is that when I heard him talking about that, I just thought, you know, isn't it like Americans to just, I mean, I don't mean to bash Americans, but I think it's a really easy thing, to, an easy way out of ever trying to be better is to say, oh, you know, you can't change. You are who you are. And I'm like, that's bullshit. You can change. It's just really, really hard. So I think that's like a, I always notice that like Americans hate the idea of, you know, a too good of a ending to a story when that happens. And movies, the, the popular movie tends to be the dark movie where it just ends with the sad ending or it ends with the bad ending and it ends with the dark, unvarnished truth of it all. But I'm like, you know, that just makes an easy way of out of ever trying to be better or do better. My problem was that I didn't, I didn't buy the redemptive story and it didn't give any sort of causal indication for why it happened. And he just like raped himself to exhaustion, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the actual writing, I agree. I don't like if I'm just reading that book and I didn't hear the foreword, I'm thinking he did not have enough meat to really say that that was redemption. Okay. But like chapter 22, yeah. uh, chapter 22, he has an insurance claim. Like, do you think he's going to act reasonably like a good member of society? Like, someone curses him. There's no indication that he is actually... I want, I want to say this is, this is actually quite realistic in that I knew a bunch of people who were sociopaths when they were teenagers, and they grew up to be, like, insurance adjusters. I just mean, like, if, I do, if I'm thinking about my friend... That is, that is perfect. I'm not kidding, though, that, like, they're, like, people really are just horrible human beings when they're... <laughs> teenagers and i i'm very sensitive to this fact because i was kind of on the for the brunt of this i i mean maybe i was bad myself but i i just thought that like these people are sociopaths and then they grow up and they're just like you know upstanding members of the community and it, i think it's largely just a matter of i mean my own process of kind of coming to forgive people is largely a matter of just realizing that they you know i, I kind of discount i mean kind of discounting free will to some extent and just saying, well, they were in such and such circumstances that they treated me poorly and, you know, I shouldn't hold it against them. So I, in any event, I mean, that's what it looks like what's happening at the end of the book is just that or the characters' drives are changing. And 
I think the editors must have thought that Americans wouldn't like that because it makes it seem like Alex is less of a horrible human being because it suggests that he's not this permanently evil thing. But the reason that he's not permanently evil is just because he gets like older and more boring. Yeah, we're coming up on a long one here, so maybe we can move on into the end zone. Uh, last lines. That would be wise. So, Zari, you want to go first since it's your... Uh, I actually don't have any last lines because nothing really jumped out at me. I, I did love the uh, the cadence, like you mentioned, Jennifer, and I loved actually the more you read it, the more you got into it, and the more kind of sounded symphonic. Um, the only thing I would mention is I'm disappointed that no one else admitted to being um, terrible, amoral people despite liking art, which I was hoping to mention. Uh, <laughs> the one thing I didn't get is the one uh, secondary source I had. Uh, Zizek had this thing in, I feel it was uh, Perfect Guide to Ideology or one of his other movies, where he mentioned the fact uh, that Ode to Joy has been such an eponymous uh, song. It's been used by the Nazis. It's been used by the USSR. It's been used by the uh, the Chinese under Mao, which banned every other uh, Western music as, uh, you know, bourgeois bullshit, except for the Nine Sympathy. And when Germany was still divided, uh, I think he mentioned that the Ode to Joy was played instead of an anthem when any German won at the Olympics as a, you know, conciliatory thing. Wow. Yeah. Wow. But uh, that's all I have to say. No last lines. So on to the next one. Mine's not very good, so I'll just jump in here. Uh, there, yeah, I didn't find any like diamonds. Um, this is uh, like after the first session and of the Ludovico technique, and they're going back and uh, talking to Alex about his next trip. Uh, but sir, sirs, I see what's wrong. It's wrong because it's like against society. It's wrong because every person on earth has the right to live and be happy without being beaten and kicked and knifed. I've learned a lot. Oh, really, I have. Uh, but the guy laughed. He said, the heresy of an age of reason. I see what is right and approve, but I do what is wrong. No, no, my boy, you must leave it all to us, but be cheerful about it. God, that's actually really good. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I have that underlined as well, actually. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. That, that line was, the heresy of an age of reason, I see what, say it one more time. Uh, okay, yeah, the heresy of an age of reason, I see what is right and approve, but I do what is wrong. Yeah, no, well, think about it. That goes against Plato, right? Like Plato had this idea that all people choose to do, like they're always aiming towards the good. And whenever, for some reason they do bad, it's just like a misunderstanding on their part as to what, is a misunderstanding about what the good is or how to get there. The rational yeah. is the good, right? Yeah. Yeah, but to be clear here, Alex is just lying through his teeth and is, doesn't sincerely have that. So it's not quite the same as yeah. being able to like truly see through, you know? Um, so I yeah. don't know if it disproves um, our man or not. But anyway. Yeah, no, that's that's true. I'm, I'm just pointing out the connection. True, yeah, yeah. Alex, sorry, to, just to interrupt quickly, uh, we didn't mention Alex as like a sycophantic fool is a great Alex in the book when he's just trying to lie through his teeth, as you mentioned. <laughs> I'll, I'll give I'll give one quote. OK, what is happening? This is um, Dr. Brodsky when doing the Ludovico technique, explaining what he's doing to Alex. What is happening to you now or, you know, what what but, Ale you know, when Alex feels horrible things, uh, when Alex feels sick upon doing horrible things. Uh, this is the explanation that's given to him. What is happening to you now is what should happen to any normal, healthy human organism contemplating the actions of the forces of evil, the workings, the principles of destruction. You are being made sane, you are being made healthy. Actually, I guess we, we already mentioned that, but I just, I. The thing that uh, what Jennifer was saying earlier, you know, you want kids to like desire to do good things, right? I mean, it's like this is it actually is true that this isn't what a healthy human organism really does, right? Like, the, uh, you know, you would want to not scream at the telemarketer just because you would feel bad doing it. You want to not scream at the telemarketer, you know, to for their own good or, or something, right? Like you want, you know, they're, you're supposed to like want, uh, I don't know. I mean, somehow I feel like it should be something different than just feel feeling bad. And that's why you're not bad. You actually, well, I, that you would actually want the good. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that a lot of this could come around to um, a lot of these things 
I think that Burgess is dealing in free will as like a substrate or like a metaphysic in his novel, like as a fact. And I think that there's issue with it, right? And so a lot of these things, it's because it's falling apart because, well, when you look at free will, like not really. And so a lot of the stuff just doesn't carry water philosophically sometimes because, you know, it, it's got a presupposition that has issues. But anyway. Yeah, I think it's to Burg Burgess's credit that he very much is throwing free will into doubt throughout the novel. And he's really raising a point of it more than I think his publicly stated views suggest. I mean, uh, so I, I think that that's yeah, my yeah. ultimate takeaway. Who else? And we get Jennifer and Laura, right? I have one really quick. Um, the new view is that we turn the bad into the good, all of which seems to me grossly unjust. I thought that was interesting. I thought it was like a, a nod to slave morality. I don't I, I think that would have been a road I would have liked to gone down a little bit more about the turn the other cheek and all that stuff. But uh, that's about it. I didn't, I think we said all the really good ones. I just want to say something real quick, Dan, to give you your due. I think that uh, I need to recant my point about the, the toy and the orange business. Uh, looking back at the introduction, um, uh, the author says something like this, clockwork orange, meaning that he has the appearance of an organism lovely with color and juice, but is in fact only a clockwork toy to be wound up by God or the devil, or increasingly replacing both the almighty state. So I didn't realize how Christian uh, of a view he had whenever I read that the first time. And so it seemed like there might be two different things going on, but it seems like he's not worried that we're wound up, but just that the state is winding us up. Yeah. So I think yeah. that you were right to note that. Um, well, thank you. Um, but you know, to be to give you your to give you credit is quite ambiguous. What the hell he's getting at with those images? And I kind of I know he's a lapsed Catholic, and so I I wonder what is going on with his invocation of religion. Yeah, I mistakenly gave him book. the credit. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna. I I think I mistakenly gave him the credit of being an atheist. Well, you know, boy oh boy, that thing is clearly stated in this book, although I suppose that's all for the best. First of all, death to Daniel, you took my line. Ah, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to read not from the book because the, it, it, there's just, I couldn't find really anything except the line that Daniel took. So what I'm going to read is what some stuff, something that, um, some things that Burgess said and da, 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 okay, this may not, whatever, we'll see what happens. It is significant, and this is from an um, an article that Burgess wrote in 1973 for the New Yorker magazine. It is significant that the nightmare books of our age have not been about new Draculas and Frankensteins, but about what may be termed dystopias, inverted utopias, in which an imagined megalithic government brings human life to an exquisite pitch of misery. Sinclair Lewis in It Can't Happen Here, a novel curiously neglected, presents an America that becomes fascist, and the quality of the fascism is as American as apple pie. The wisecracking homespun Will Rogers-like president uses the provisions of a constitution created by Jeffersonian optimists to create a despotism which, to the unthinking majority, at first looks like plain common sense. The trouncing of long-haired intellectuals and shrill anarchists always appeals to the average man, although it may really mean the suppression of liberal thought and the elimination of political dissidents. Orwell's 1984, a nightmare vision which may conceivably have prevented the nightmare fact from being realized, no one expects the real 1984 to be like Orwell's, shows the unabashed love of power and cruelty which too many political leaders have hidden under the flowers of inspirational rhetoric. The inner party of Orwell's future England exerts control over the population through the falsification of the past so that no one can appeal to a dead tradition of freedom through the delimitation of language so that treasonable thoughts cannot be formulated through a double think epistemology, which makes the outside world appear as the rulers wish it to appear and through simple t torture and brainwashing. Both the American and the British versions, this is a, another paragraph in this article, and it's about the different versions of his book. Both the American and the British visions can join in assuming that the aversive devices of fear and torture are the inevitable techniques of despotism, which seeks control over the individual. 
But as long ago as 1932, Aldous Huxley in his Brave New World demonstrated the submissive docility that powerful states seek from their subjects as being more easily obtainable through non-aversive techniques. Prenatal and infantile conditioning make the slaves happy in their slavery, and stability is enforced not through whips, but through scientifically imposed contentment. I'm not here to go through <laughs> Brave New World because we've already done that last night. But I, I found this article uh, that he wrote. It's very long and, and kind of interesting. And he digs into politics and literature on many different fronts and really at the core of this book and I guess movie to a point. And that has to do with the enforced conditioning of, of the mind however good the social intention, but the enforced conditioning is evil itself. So.